going to turn the page now and we're going to start talking about the wife, okay? We talked a lot about the husband, we're going to talk about a Christian wife, that's going to be page four. I hope that you will, the reason I put this down in print so that you can have something to take with you, and it would be profitable if you could review this again when our week is over. I'm not being consistent with reading all the scripture, uh, mostly because of time sake, but at the same time, it's not that it's unimportant, I, and I hope that you might, you might do a little bit of a more thorough study of the subject than I've done with you, because you may not have the, the problem with the time element. Okay? So I just want to challenge you while it's on my mind about that. And I also want to say that for our students, that I'm hoping toward the end, like I say Thursday evening or so, maybe we could gather for an informal time of question and answer, if that's okay with you. I <clears throat> decided not to do that up front because usually what happens is people ask questions that I'm going to handle in the lecture. And that's kind of a you know, uh, what's the word I want to say? Uh, superfluous, that's not the right word, but I'd like, to, I'd like to find out what's really on your mind. And if we could have an informal discussion, not that I have all the answers for you, but I'd like to share my heart with you if I can at this stage of the game. Uh, and um, there's some things that I'm sure that we're not gonna be able to talk about here publicly. So I want you to I want to have, want you to have that opportunity now. Um, I don't know how. As I said, that would be our little powwow together. Okay. We're talking first of all about the Christian wife and her position, and we see that in Ephesians 5, 22, 24, 23. So let me just take time to read that portion again. We're gonna, we've been reading some of these same scriptures over and over, but I hope that they will become very familiar with you. Ephesians 5. Following, of course, the key verse, which was what, verse 18. We said that the husband needs to what, be filled with the Holy Spirit, but that's certainly true of the wife as well. To have a spirit-filled relationship with one another is something that's heaven on earth, right? And, and, and we talk about, you know, a congregation being filled with the Spirit, but we need to back up because a congregation is based on what, family? And you know and I know that if the devil can destroy this basic unit that God has ordained called a home, he'll destroy the church. He's way ahead of us. And I marvel how wise that God has given him, a, as James says, a demonic wisdom. By the way, you know, there's, there's demonic wisdom and then there's true wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But I find every day people that are con artists have wisdom in the world. I mean, they are worldly wise. They can sell ice to the Eskimos, I'm just telling you. The world's filled with them. And the, the scripture indicates that they are smarter than the people of God. That's why you and I have all the more reason why we need to be plugged in to the Shema and to the Spirit of God, okay? I'll tell you, this, this, uh, this world is filled with satanic minds, if you will, that will blow up in your face at any time. So with that in mind, 522 says, wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, that's very important. It doesn't just say submit yourselves unto your husband, but as unto the Lord. That, that gives a, a, another dimension. Why? Because the husband is the head of the wife. Not the dictator of the wife. He's the head of the wife. He's, a, he's like a manager. He's like a leader, as we said before. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. 
So there's that the idea of protecting again. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now that's true. That means a husband needs to be walking with God in everything. That's a tall order right there. See, that's the thing. People pick and choose, you know, well, well, a wife ought to submit to her. Yeah, but what about the husband? If he's not what he should be, the wife's got a real problem with that. And she should not have a problem with that. And frankly, I don't think a godly wife would make a problem out of that. Because a husband would walk in wisdom and understanding. It all works together in this intimacy, if you will. Husbands love your wives. Okay, we talked about that, but let's go down. Um, let's go down to verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. That's interesting, isn't it? People don't hate themselves, really. They may hate themselves psychologically at times because things aren't going right, but nobody hates their body. When they have an ache, they do something about it. The body ministers to the body. Right. And that same attitude reflects our attitude toward our spouse. Can I just testify, you know, as a caregiver for years, several years, I thought to myself, when we stood at the altar when we were two young kids, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, till death do you part. And I, I was thinking of I was thinking to myself, hey, pal, let's get this thing over with. I want to get married. I don't want, I'm not interested. I didn't say that, but I'm not, I'm not. But in eagerness, I was waiting for the ceremony to be over. Get on the show. Get on the honeymoon. Which, by the way, was not all that it was cracked up to be. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it, how, how brief the honeymoon is? I just thought about giving myself, even at this stage of the game, and the people here that know what I'm talking about, when I'm watching a TV show, and my wife says, I, could you please help me with my socks? And you may just be enjoying a drink, watching the show, and what happens? You've got to quit right there and want to minister. But I got to realize that I'm not ministering to her, I'm ministering to me. Because we're one. It's a whole different ball game. And what does a God pay love? A God pay said, oh shucks, why does she have to put her socks on right now? <laughs> but by the grace of God, you say, well, this is the need and you what? You give yourself to the one who's actually one with you. huh? Just like you would if you had something in your eye and you, you try to get it out or you got a, a, an ache of some sort. In other words, it's a wonderful thing when you think how God put this thing together between a husband and a wife. And what I'm trying to tell you, young people, is that this thing works. Amen. So I don't know about the, you know, I get started and all, and I don't know whether I'm going to, how it's going to end it up. Well, you've got to leave that with the Lord. But I'll tell you what, if you get on the right road, it'll lead to the right place, whatever the case. Yes. Okay. I've even told couples, and I share this with you, this is, I have, I knew them quite well before I could say this, but I used to say, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, the whole thing about getting married, and they, by the way, I've never seen an ugly bride. <laughs> never seen one. I don't know what they do the night before, but boy, they, even, even folks that look a little bit homely, they really look good on them. Wedding day. Or maybe the veil helps, I don't know. But it's amazing how they can get spiffed up. I said, I said, uh, a couple of women, and I, you know, I'm known to do stuff like this, and I said to the guy, to the gal, or I said to the, the husband to be, I said, hey, take a look at her. This is at the wedding ceremony now. I said, she'll never look like that again. <laughs> I said, I said that's, she'll, she'll put that dress in the closet. She'll never do that again. 
And then I said, I said to the to the to the bride, I said, take a look at this dude with a cummerbund around his waist. I said, he'll never, he'll never get into that tuxedo again, especially after you feed him the biscuits and the gravy. That's why that's why I don't recommend people buying a tux. You rent a tux. <laughs> And then I, and I don't want to discourage you, but the honeymoon may not be all that you think it is. I didn't say this, but I remember a couple going on a honeymoon and they, they went to Cancun, I think it was, and they had Montezuma's disease the whole week. <laughs> what a honeymoon that must have been. Now that's a little extreme, I know. But what I'm trying to tell you, it's over quick. And then you look at what the vows mean. Then you find out what love is about. And if you're looking for just a, an emotional time, it's going to be real brief. But isn't God good to give us agape love and phileo love and the right kind of love that will sustain us and cause us to grow in grace and love each other more as the days and the years pile up as we grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all what? It's all a testimony and a picture of coming attractions, if you will, one day when we see our beloved bridegroom in person. My wife, soon after we were married, I told her, I said, this, I said, you know, I, I've been toying with this whole idea of predestination. Because the theologians have been challenging me, do you believe in predestination? That's you know, that's that Calvinistic stuff. And uh, I said, well, I said, yes, I said, uh, we're gonna be together in heaven one day, but we're not gonna be married. And she fell apart on it. She started to weep. She couldn't believe that we weren't gonna be married today, but what are we gonna do? And I said, you know what, I said, our relationship is a picture of what it's going to be, but you and I are going to be part of the bride of Christ, and we're going to be married to Jesus forever. I don't know whether she was thrilled about that. <laughs> but she got the point eventually. That this marriage thing is a picture of what it's going to be like. Hey, all that we're doing, folks, is a preview of coming attractions. This is, somebody said, this is the kindergarten of eternity. We're gonna keep on keeping on forever. And frankly, can you picture, take a, take a look, if you're saved and I'm saved, we're stuck with each other. Yes. That's a thought, isn't it? <laughs> well, I hope something happens good to you and me before that time, so that we would be able, by the grace of God, with eternal, Vigilance and the love of God that passes understanding will be able to love each other as we should. By the way, just for the record, what happens with people that we never really got reconciled with? You ever wonder about that? People that, frankly, we never, frankly, got along too well, and they're saved. What's going to happen in heaven? I, I personally think that when we, by the time we get there, the majesty and the glory of God is going to be so wonderful so invigorating and majestic that all that petty stuff will be burned up forever. Amen? Even though we're going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ, but we're not going to be spanked. We're going to be rewarded. So what our hand finds to do now, let's do it with all of our might. And by the way, that's one of the greatest challenges to new converts. People say, well, you know, I'm once saved, I was saved. It doesn't make any difference what I do since I've been saved. First of all, pal, if that's your attitude, you better check whether you're really saved. That's right. And second of all, it does, makes all the difference in time and eternity what you do since you become a Christian. Because your sin's been dealt with. You're going to face God at the beam of seat of Christ. And he's going to hand out rewards to those who are what? Faithful. Faithful. Moreover, it's, it's what? It's required of a steward to be found what? Faithful. Faithful. <coughs> okay. And marriage and home is all part of that. Okay. So, I didn't finish verse 33. And the wife 
see that she was reverence her husband. That doesn't mean you have to call him reverend. <laughs> I don't like the word. People use it. I'm coming to realize that the word doctor is not a bad word. You know, you know, I found that out. I, I've asked doctors over the years, what does doctor mean? They don't know. But Jesus faced the doctors of the law in the temple. You remember that? Yeah. And one day it dawned on me, doctor comes from the word doctrine. Teaching. These were men who were teaching the law. I like that. I like that better than reverend. I, so I probably use the word more than I should, maybe. I don't know. But uh, And we have doctor's degrees, and, but some... The problem is some people die by degrees. <laughs> but I think you can be fired up by degrees too. It just depends. It depends what school you go to. <laughs> I'm coming back. Wife means weaver. You ever think about that? The husband supplies the wife with rich graces and blessing. She weaves them into a priceless garment for the whole family to wear. How blessed is a home with a weaver. The husband's supposed to be the breadwinner, we know that. Now, we're living in a comp complicated day and we'll discuss it as we go along. This whole thing, you know, when I was growing up, mothers didn't work outside the home at all, unless they were really in bad shape, you remember? Uh, they, they were home when the kids came home and uh, they, kept the house and husband went out at breadwinners and things have changed considerably from that day and we want to remark about that, about that as we go. But submissiveness to the husband, verse 22, the word submit, hupostasa, standing below, to continually subject oneself, obey, to yield to one's control. Now that sounds like a nasty word, doesn't it? Obey, submit. Because we don't understand it in context, that's why. Because it sounds like something that's thrusted upon us, like bondage. I've been toying with the idea of writing a book on slavery. I'd probably end up in jail. But you know what, when you think about it, Paul said, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. What's wrong with that? He said, I was a slave of the devil. Now I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. But to be a slave of Jesus Christ is to be free. Right. That's about all I want to say about that. I'm still waiting for some preachers to preach on Philemon, the plantation church. Never hear anything about it. Runaway slave came back. He said, now, now you guys, you're the master, he's the servant, and you're both brothers in Christ, and now you have him forever. What do you do with that? Nobody talks about it. I'm simply saying is, there's nothing wrong with slavery if you've got the right master. Right. That's, exactly That's the problem right there. <clears throat> huh? I had a guy pipe up in my class years ago. In, in my class in, in, the, in the mission. Ernest White, his name was. He was black. He said, Doc, he said, I thank God for slavery. And I said, whoa, whoa. And people looked at each other, what in the world? What do you mean, pal? And he said, well, he said, I come, my great-great-grandfather was a slave. But he said he had a master that was benevolent and kind and gracious. And when the time of the emancipation came, he didn't want to move. He wanted to stay right there. In fact, that master gave him 60 acres of land, family. And he said a good percentage of it is still in the family today. And he said that would have never happened had I come from Africa, had I lived in Africa. Now again, we always, we always look at the negative side. That's a positive testimony. Regardless of how you look at the, the, the system, it was a system, okay? But biblically speaking, we're to be, uh, be enslaved, imprisoned, if you will, chained 
to Jesus Christ. Because if you're chained to the devil, you're lost forever. But when he breaks the chain in redemption, he doesn't just let us go free. He chains us to himself. And now we're a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. So taking that thought, a godly wife with a godly husband would be thrilled to be a slave because she knows that she would be treated like a princess. It's the fact that we've corrupted this relationship. And then guys come around and they're tyrants and, and, uh, and, and wreck everything in the home, you know? And, and, and they get divorced, and then what do they do? They jump into another relationship That's and right. carry the same baggage from one relationship to the other instead of dealing with stuff. By the way, can I, can I give you a profound statement? It dawned on me when somebody brought this up and I had never thought about it. Problems are for solving. How does that grab you? Problems are for solving. Most people, problems are for running. How do I get out of this? But God has ordained that we deal with problems. We solve problems. And we can by the grace of God. And that's so true in a marital relationship. We talked about, you know, people that, well, I don't, I don't, ever, I don't ever blow up with my wife. He said, I just don't talk to her for about a week and a half. Yeah, and, he, and every time he comes to a meal, he's getting an ulcer. Every time he comes to the meal, he's, he's, he's boiling on the inside. And by the way, that uh, Chester, that's a good way to have a heart attack, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> In other words, you can't, your system can't take that for any length of time. Sometimes better to just to blow off and get it off your chest, but better than that to submit it to the Lord and deal with it properly by the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God. So how does the word submit used in the scripture? Well, notice again, I have given you five illustrations. As a church to Christ, in, in other words, we submit to the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a relationship uh, as a citizen to the government, Romans 13. As a servant to a master. And let me make clear, because I will we'll get some flack on this, what I just said. But the point being that it's not always the system just like our country, our beloved America. The system, why are people changing the system? The problem is not with the system, it's with the people that run it. Yes. What a great adventure and experiment is the United States of America, if you will. And look at what people are doing with it because they believe this evolutionary principle in a political arena. This is why the, these politicians are trying to bring a utopia to America. You know what they're trying to do? In theological terms, they're trying to bring in the kingdom. With the culture stuff, with the, the racism, with the, the green, uh, you know, the, uh, all the stuff that's going on with, the, with automobiles and, and energy, et cetera, et cetera. They're playing God. And I'm glad one day, by the grace of God, he's going to put it down. But in the meantime, back at the ranch, you and I have to live in this atmosphere. And the only thing I know, and, and people have asked me, for instance, and you can apply this to Sonoya, I'm applying it to Youngstown, Ohio. Well, we need to save the community. I said, well, how do you do that? The civil rights movement isn't gonna change it. The only way you can change your community is to save and see one person in, at a time saved in that community. It's gotta be an individual thing. You don't just save a community. The people in that community need to be converted. And that's it's true everywhere, isn't it? But it starts at home. Everything starts at home. Yes, sir. Okay? So, younger to the elder. I appreciate the attitude. I want to tell you, fellas, I appreciate your attitude toward your elders. You see that a lot. It's a beautiful thing to behold. There's something that goes with age, and I know, I just wish I could get old without becoming decrepit. <laughs> I just lost a dear friend, Tony Ritchie, one of our men who met with a 
doctor friend that we meet on Tuesday morning. He just died at 93. Came to every meeting, in pain. Prostate cancer along in his bone was everywhere. And he used to say, every time you talked to him, this was his, this was his remark. Well, he said, brother, he said, I'm going to live forever. But this aging process stinks. Just when you think you get your act together, you get arthritis, he says, it comes up, you know? It's amazing how it works. But how to grow more gracefully, that's another thing. That's right, brother. Amen. I've met few people that have actually grown old gracefully. <clears throat> how to grow old without becoming a crank or being an undue burden to your family. We have a ministry in our sunset years. Sure. Evidently, that's why God's kept some of us around, you know? And I'll tell you, as I told Chris, I want to, I just want to finish my course, whatever that is. Right. Huh? Yes. <clears throat> but we need a what? We need a triumphal entry into glory. I don't want somebody dragging me across the threshold. I want to go with a string of souls behind me. We're building bridges for those who are coming behind us, and we need to get with the program, even though we may not be able to run a race physically. And so, you young people, you need to praise God for your start, and I thank God for the homes that we have represented here, and I'm glad the devil doesn't have all the homes. And so, let's do what God called us to do here as wives, if you will. Point, point B, you notice is marriage is not a 50-50 deal, no. but 100-100. Well, I'll carry half the load, you take her. No, it doesn't work that way. We give ourselves fully, whether it be husband or wife, and the wife has this privilege because of the relationship that God has ordained. Success comes when both husband and wife function totally in their God-given roles, both equal, but differ in function. That's a great statement, by the way. Success in marriage comes when both husband and wife function totally in their God-given roles, both equal, both are equal, but they differ in function. Well, I believe in equality, so the Bible teaches that. But even though we're equal before God, we have different roles and different functions. That's right. My eyes different than my ear. And it's sure my eyes are sure different than my big toe. And if I get an itch on my neck, and if I didn't have hands, I'd be in trouble. I'd have a hard time, especially now, getting my big toe up to my neck to scratch it in the back. And if I needed, if I didn't, I couldn't bend down, I'd have to sometimes stand on my head to get something done. The body ministers functionally, but every part of that body is essential. And I shared with you about the toe situation. Many people in church think that they're nobody, but they're somebody. They may not be out in the open, which might be a blessing, by the way. You know, there's some people that don't talk much, and I think it's to their benefit. Because when you don't say anything, you give the impression that you're smart. But as soon as you open your mouth, you give it away. <laughs> so maybe it's just as well that we don't say much. But whatever the case, we all have a ministry. And even sometimes at home, maybe it's good not to say anything. Can I just share something really stupid in a sense? But I've been sitting in my in Motel 5, I think it is Motel 5. I don't, have a, I don't have a big screen in front of me. Not even a computer. And I was sitting there one day, I said, man, it would be nice to turn that thing on. Maybe there's, maybe there's a football game on or something, you know? Nothing. And you know what, I sat there and I bit the bullet and after a while, I started to enjoy the quiet. I started to enjoy the silence. 
In fact, I toyed with the idea of becoming a hermit up in Canada. <laughs> out in the boonies. I'll bet Marcus thought about that. <laughs> you know, just living off the land, if you will. You know, I mean, I was daydreaming, but all my point is, things are too noisy. There's something to be said about Simon. Not that there's anything wrong with being plugged into what's going on. I don't mean that. But at the same time, we need to take time to get quiet. Be still and know that I am God. Yes, sir. Okay, let's uh, look at another one. Wife's submission is not hindrance to her freedom, but the release and assurance of it. And here's that illustration I wanted to give you the other night, if you remember. Um, I don't know what I, I can't really draw it, but just a, just a thought. When you look at a, this is a train, okay? You with me? It's got wheels, and it's on a track. That train is free to move as long as it's on the track. But if it falls off, it what? It loses its freedom. Because a train is made to run on a track. And when we talk about freedom spiritually, we're only free, the track represents God's holiness and God's word. Yes. Amen. And, we're, and when we're off track spiritually, we're not free. We're, we're only free to function when we line up with God's holiness. Which leads me to another thing. What is the definition of holiness anyhow? You know, can I tell you that when I first got saved and I heard about holiness people, I, I, I was ministered to greatly by Western Methodist people in South Carolina. They were godly people and they, um, excuse me. I hadn't been to church, I didn't know, I went to church there and people, they were dressed in long, you know, the black dresses and the bun in the back and no makeup. The guys, you know, were just spiffy and and, and, and I'm, that's, I'm not being critical. That, that was just the way it was. But that one lady, one night in the meeting, she stood up and she shouted on the top of her lungs and I almost had a heart attack. I was sitting right behind her and they started waving their hankies, you know, and my roommate from Bob Jones, we sat there. I didn't know whether to crawl into the pew or run out the back door. I was scared to death. And they had to, but you know, they had us to dinner. And they had the fried chicken. Chris actually learned how to make iced tea, a jewel tea from one of those ladies in that church. They even gave me a shower for Chris and they never met her. I, I'll tell you about that sometime. But they were godly people. They, they loved, but the point is I never, when I think holiness, I think of dress only. But I want to tell you, it's more to it than that. Not that dress isn't important, but I have a little scheme here. I want to, here's my formula if you want to jot it down on your sheet. Holiness equals plus R, that's righteousness, and J, that's justice. Real simple. So what's holiness? Does that mean that we have to walk around like we're sucking gas out of a three-inch pipe? I don't think so. There, you get the impression that if you're holy, you're not joyous. I don't think that's totally wrong. But I like to use this illustration because in, in Hebrews 1 9 is a good text if you want to look at it. I think also Psalm 110 that the Lord, he loved righteousness and he hates iniquity. What is righteousness? It's his love for what's right. What's justice? His hatred for what's wrong. That's two sides of the same coin. In other words, what you love and what you hate determine what, who you are. Right. You tell me what you love, I'll tell you who you are. You tell me what you hate, I'll tell you who you are. So, when we're unsaved, what's the deal? We're unholy, what does that mean? We hate what God loves. This is what, love or righteousness? And this, of course, is hatred. I'll just put that down, even though you can't read it. So when we're unsaved, we're what? We're, we, we hate what God loves, 
and we love what God hates. And wonder of wonders, when you get born of the Spirit of God, all of a sudden, what happens? You start loving what God loves, like His Word and His people. And you start hating what God, nobody had to tell me I had to come out of the gym. No, it was the grace of God that taught me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Yes, sir. I started loving what God loves. I started hating what God hates. And guess what? I started to grow in grace. It's called sanctification. I think that's a simple definition of holiness. We're becoming what? More and more like our holy Savior. Now, wouldn't that be that kind of attitude, I think, is facilitated in the home. Not faking it, but actually loving what God loves and hating what God hates, okay? So as we look back here, this relationship between husband and wife is a testimony of walking in consortium or in on track with God and His holiness. And it's represented by the fact that the wife can now, if she has a godly husband that's on track with God, she has no problem submitting to him. In fact, she wants to. Women are seemingly based on Now, they can run the show just like kids if you want them to, but they don't desire to do that. I've seen that over the years. And, and, the, and the husband, if you're like, well, what do you think? And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that sometime. One of, the, one of the things that really bugs a woman is when they go out on a date, and by the way, I'm gonna recommend dating for, for couples. You wanna have a date every week somewhere, even if it's at McDonald's. Where you go is not the, not the important thing, just getting together and courting again and looking at each other eyeball to eyeball and whispering sweet nothings while you're chomping on a hamburger. There you go. It'll come up somewhere when we get to it, but it, men, listen to me. One of the things that women detest is when you go out for dinner and you ask the wife, where do you want to go? They hate that. Especially if you're courting somebody. You don't, you don't look at the gal and say, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go to eat? They hate that. They want you to have your mind made up ahead of time what you think is best. And this is where we're going, by the grace of God. That's just a good, simple illustration. That, that, that girl wants to know that you really are thinking about her. And uh, we'll do more about that. That's just a kind of a preview of what we're going to talk about later. So submission ensures God's blessing and protection, point C. Physically, husband protects the body. You know, the, you know I, when I think about the government, and this, this is really crazy, when, when we grew up, we protected women. Yes, sir. You went to bat for a woman, even if you didn't know her. That's right. Now, how in the world have we come to the place where we're putting women in combat? That's right. We started out, and I saw it coming right away. As soon as you have, you got policemen now, and all of a sudden, you got a cohort in the next seat who's married with three kids, and your 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 buddies in a police car. Now nobody talks about this, do they? I saw it coming on TV. And you're parked behind Walmart at three in the morning when there's not much action, and so you find out after a while there's some action. That's crazy. Yes. A state trooper, New Jersey state trooper, was saved in our church in in Marlton, New Jersey. That's a good story. He was on he was on the Unshackled. His story was on that program for Moody. From Pacific Garden Mission, if you remember. And he, you know, the first thing they did, they tried their best to destroy him. He walked into the barracks one day after he professed Christ and he was open about it. And they had the, they had the girly magazines under his pillow. He was supposed to go to a conference, a police conference. Do you know they they got some uh, some nice looking uh, state trooper, if you will, to go with him. They said, well, where's she gonna stay? They said, well, we've got her booked up with you in the same room. Now this guy's married with a family. What I'm saying is, how do we get this far? You see, this is destructive. And, and we need to recognize that we have to deal with things God's way and, uh, and, and protect ourselves. 
a woman, a, a, a man has to protect a woman. And we'll see too that a woman also protects a man. That's yes, right. I'm going to share with you that uh, my wife has has probably saved me out of at least three or four fiascos because she was discerning. Big macho me, I could man, I could handle her now, and she said, "You're not going to handle this. You're out of your league now." I'm just telling you, it works both ways. We need to protect one another. Why would you put a woman on the front row in combat when you need to protect women? But you see, what have we done? We've had the breakdown of the difference between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And we're in the midst of all that. That's why what we're talking about here, frankly, is so old, it's new. Right. I mean, there's some people that take issue with the, these things we're talking about, okay? So, spiritual service, certainly you set the spiritual agenda. And by the way, a husband needs to protect the mental agenda of a wife. Sometimes, let me give you an illustration of that. Why, tell me, a wife is not wired like a man, emotionally. So there's exception to that. But I want to tell you how I found out over the years. I found out that you can't allow your wife to deal with a neighbor if there's some kind of a conflict between the fence on the property, let's say. You don't do that. Or if a man calls, a neighbor calls and says, I want to talk to you about this situation. You, you, you don't, you say, my husband will have to deal with you about And I found out when my wife had, was confronted with some of that things, it was an emotional strain until I got smart. And I realized that I, I must never let her get in that bind again, even with telemarketers. And I want to tell you what, she became a master at this. <laughs> in other words, she, she got off the hook time and time again now. She took it to the other extreme. She wouldn't deal with anything. She said, my husband will be home at five o'clock. You talk to him. <laughs> and she went emotionally free, if you will. She stayed on the upper side because she refused to deal with anything. She put the whole weight on me, but rightly so. She shouldn't have to be dealing with my neighbor. I don't want to deal with my neighbor, okay? So you can make the application on that. There's things that a wife should never be expected to do. Whether the husband's there or not. If he's in California, call him up on the phone. Or it'll have to wait till he gets home. Shows reverence down the bottom to our husband. This is, exemplifies true marriage to children. You ever think about that? In other words, the wife's attitude toward the husband will reflect on the children. They'll get the impression about what it means to be submissive to the Lord, among other people. Evidently, this is some bearing. You know, in the old days, you remember when you went to school, the parents and the teachers were on the same team. That's right. Some of you can remember, if you got in trouble at school, where, where else did you get in trouble? <laughs> yeah, I've had it happen. The only day I remember, I, I got the Board of Education on the seat. The only day I, I wore two pairs of pants uh, to school. And I got it. And then on the way home, there was a woodshed revival. <laughs> but the point is, the teachers and the parents got along. You know, you know, you, you grew up, some of you grew up with your parents saying, listen, the teacher's right. The teacher's always right. Unless it's obvious. And there wasn't many times it was obvious. But today, when parents would come in with the kid and they got an issue with the teacher, the student can't be wrong. My kid doesn't do anything wrong. He's a genius. What's the matter with you? You're not teaching the course. And so that's what you have to contend with. Why? Because many times the kids are not seeing a relationship of authority in the home or submissiveness. When you had parents and they said the teacher was right, they were saying what? As you're submissive to me as a father or mother, so you need to be submissive to authority when you get to church or you get to the school. It all carries over. So why do we have rebels everywhere in society? Because they're rebels at home. If they have one, 
I mean, we're in bad shape. I mean, let's face it. It's going to take something miraculous to turn any of this around. And let's listen. I think God's going to work with the ones and the twos. We have to begin somewhere. Is that my alarm clock? <laughs> okay. Okay, turn the page. Give me just a minute. Can I just take a few minutes and we'll be done? This I want you to have to do this for homework, it looks like. What's your purpose? This is page five. To be a husband's help me. A surrounding. She come, and we talked about that back in Genesis. She completes a man. Did you know a godly woman wants to complete a man? That's a marvelous thing when you think about it. Not good for a man to be alone. God gave him the help to me. Not a, not a sidekick. I heard somebody say recently, a gal I was counseling, said, I don't want a sidekick, I want a husband. I want someone that loves me. Well, he says, let's take a trip. Yeah, let's take a trip, but I feel like I'm just taking room in the other seat. It's amazing the attitude that there is among couples. I've had them come, I've had them come for counseling, and I have made it, I made it such that I only had to, I had the, the, my desk and my chair, but I had a love seat and a couch. Now, what's the difference? One cushion. Huh? And they would come in, and they would come in, and uh, boy, you could tell just they were, they, they were Zangers Hornets. Where do you think they sat? They did not sit on the love seat. The first thing they did, they got, they got to the couch. Where do you think they sat on the couch? They were hugging the armrests on either side. If they could have gotten, a, if they could put another cushion between them, they would have done it. And they started spouting off. By the way, I, I, I believe in meeting with both of them at the same time instead of meeting with one and let them spout off and then you got to meet with the other one. I believe in taking a stick of dynamite like that and going down to the basement and blow the whole house up and start over again. There's a way to do that, by the way. But the point being that they came in and, you know, she had a list. This kind of, this side, both sides of the list. All that she had beats against him. And she read that thing off in my presence and his presence. She read the whole thing off. He sat there like, a, I don't know what was going through his mind. But I dealt with this, some issues and you know what, we came back. And, um, and I'm gonna give you an illustration of this. This is how I approached it. This is a godly triangle. This is a good counseling tool if you want to use it. God up at the realm. We got a man here, okay? And we got a woman here. Hopefully the husband and wife. And they're on the outs with each other. So what's the problem? We're gonna deal with that quickly. The point being, I told them, you know, I said, if you're on the outs with each other, one of you or both of you is out of whack with God. And there's no way you're gonna deal with this issue between you by psychology, if you will, or what they call uh, behavioral modification. In other words, <clears throat> the idea, when you go home, make sure when she zigs, you zag. And if she zags, make sure you zig. And God forbid if you both zig at the same time, you're in trouble. That's not the way you deal with that. You can't make that happen. But I found out if you deal with it from this standpoint, and they deal with that, they do their homework, this will drop off. And they'll be in fellowship with what? With each other when they get right with God. But this couple came in, and there they were, man, when they had the list. And the next time they came, they sat on the couch again. They didn't hug them all the rest as much as they did before. But you know what? He, she forgot the sheep. And, 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 and I said, oh, thank God for that. But you know what she said, may I, may I, may I speak? She went through the whole sheet, she had it memorized. She didn't need the sheet. <laughs> she went through the whole name and badgered that guy. And when we were really to, to deal with her conscience about where she was with God, I'm glad to tell you that they came back later on. They sat together on the couch. And the third session they came in, guess what? They were holding hands. Where do you think they sat? They sat on the love seat. Nonverbal communication. They didn't have to say anything. Just looking at them. 
and looking at the thing. I knew that something had happened. It doesn't happen that way all the time. But the point is that as when we're on the outs with each other, as a husband and wife, we need to what? We need to deal with it and get right with God and then have fun getting right with each other, if you will. Okay? Let me just quickly go down and I'm almost done. You, you knew I was going to get to this eventually, the Proverbs 31 woman. I gave my, my Proverbs book to somebody, and before they accepted it, they turned to Proverbs 31 to see what I had to say. <laughs> and then they made up their mind whether they wanted to uh, go with it or not. But if you can have a woman, husbands, and a woman can be something like this Proverbs woman, by the way, as you will see as you go through it, Look what it says. Godly character, she had a priceless treasure. I'm not, I'm not going to turn to the scripture now. We can do that later. Trustworthy, good, or godly, diligent, not lazy, honorable, kind, industrious, praiseworthy, fearing the Lord, and efficient testimony. In other words, we were talking about people working outside the home. Isn't it amazing that in this day, if a woman has to work outside the home, she can work inside the home with a computer. You know, we talk about help wanted ads all over the creation, but do you understand that there are people that are making millions of dollars in their pajamas? <laughs> the truth. And so in the, we live in a day when, a, when if a parent has to work, they can work at home and still keep the house. That's quite a deal. It's almost a Proverbs 31 situation. This girl was absolutely stupendous in what she was able to accomplish. But leave it to a woman. They praised her husband at the gate, not because he was anything, but because of his wife. Well, I know something about that. Huh? It's amazing what wives can do, what testimony they have, what clout they have yes. on the outside of the home. How wonderful it is to have a wonderful wife, okay? And so I'm ending with this statement in this sheet, and we'll pick it up next time in the next sheet. Titus 2, 5, 2, verses 1 through 5, talks about women in the home, setting the pace, teaching their what? Teaching the other women to love their husbands. Right. Isn't that a, not to make a buck, but to love their husbands. To settle, to have a quality time together in a, in a, 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 a secure home setting that love Jesus. And the rest will take care of itself. You know, I've said to men over the years, you don't need to worry about, if you, listen, if you learn to live, you never have to worry about making a living. If you learn how to live, you will never have a problem making a living. But if you don't know how to live, you'll go through money like water. Amen. It won't make any difference. You'll never be successful. Amen. But if you ever learn how to live, you will know how to work and how to deal with things properly, including your home. And so the greatest, Martin Luther put it this way, he said of his wife, the greatest gift of God is a pious, amicable, that is a pleasing disposition, spouse who fears God, loves his house, and with whom one can live in perfect confidence. That's a great statement. And I pray that as we contemplate the future of some of you and those of you present, still en route, God's still working on me, right? We're still in a situation. There's room for spiritual growth and improvement, loving one another. These things that we've heard many times and we know are true, but it's another thing, what? Another thing putting them into operation. And many times the trials that we face will make that real. That's why we don't despise the day of small things. We don't get all bent out of shape when things don't go. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known to God. And God will use the trial, as James said, to what? To perfect us and to make us more like himself and more loving to each other and an example to our children and to other people's children. This is an ongoing enterprise, and I pray for a Holy Ghost multiplication. We need an epidemic of godly homes. And I pray that we'll be part, us here, part of the solution and not part of the problem.
Father, we just commit this time to you. Help us to ponder what you're talking to us about. Make the word alive. Bring that spirit of love and grace to our homes and even couples here, even our young people. I pray that you'll prepare them for what you have for them in the future, whether regardless what the circumstance or individuals that will come into their lives. And we're just going to thank you and praise you for what you do, even in the remainder of these days together. And in the future time afterward, we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.